Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, he wrote them a couple of letters, uh, and we're looking at the first one, uh, and we're looking at the second chapter of the first one. Uh, so let me read the first few verses of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, so, for you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we have boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity, impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labour and toil. We worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So there's quite a lot in there to unpack. And uh, I think there are some useful messages for us. For, uh, um, for any church, for us as a church, isn't it? So I want to share more, what it, uh, more of what it is to be church um, through the eyes of Paul as he writes to the church in what is, uh, is now Salonica in, in Greece. Paul had moved to Athens after his visit to uh, Thessalonica um, and he'd, he'd not long left when he wrote this letter um, and it's thought it may have only been about three weeks uh, since he had left Thessalonica and, and uh, got to Athens. Uh, but yet he received some news of trouble from Timothy. Uh, and Luke tells us in Acts 17, from verse 5, that when Paul planted the church in Thessaloniki, the Jews were jealous and set the city in uproar. Um, and it's, we can, you know, we can puzzle about what that means. What does it mean to set a city in uproar? Uh, but I think, the, you know, it was the talk of the town. Um, there, was, uh, uh, there was lots of news going around. Um, because if what the Thessalonian believers were now proclaiming, that Jesus was Lord, that was a real problem for the Jews. And they would be in some difficulty if the gospel uh, caught fire in the town, in the city of Thessalonica, um, then the Jews would be in some difficulty. And the people of the church that Paul is now writing to are proclaiming the gospel of Christ. If it catches on, it will change everything. And we know that because it did catch on and it did change everything. Now, if you want to discredit a story, uh, one of the easiest ways is, of doing it is to discredit the person telling the story. Uh, it's called an ad hominem attack. And you hear it all the time. Uh, have you ever listened to a politician? Very sensitive. Um, if, if Dave wanted to try and uh, tell something to the church that I wanted to disagree with rather than challenging it, if I just say, no, you know, Dave, you know, you know what he's like, he's a liar and a cheat and a drunkard and so on. Uh, and he's got long hair. <laughs> and he's got long hair. So you can't believe really, really anything he said. He's got long hair. Yes, he does probably a bit kind of. Are you recording that? So just for the record, for the recording, Dave has got long hair. The other things are made up. <laughs> But attacking your, attacking your opponent is a much easier, because if, if I convince you that Dave is any of those things, then I don't really need to argue about the argument. Yeah, yeah, he is like that. Um, yeah, everything he says is probably going to be true. Um, so the Jews were, um, rather than arguing about the message, were discrediting Paul. Uh, and it doesn't define what their accusations were against him, and, uh, but they were discrediting him. So Paul, in this passage, defends himself. Not because he wants to claim greatness for himself, uh, but he wants to defend himself so that people will say, okay, if Paul is the man of integrity he claims to be, then his message is worth hearing. And so, uh, verse 3, 4, and 5, uh, 
uh, is very encouraged by a uh, very positive message from Paul. Our appeal does not spring from error or impunity or any attempt to deceive, but we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak not to please man, but to please God. We never came with words of flattery, nor with a pretext. God is our witness. He sounds like he's defending himself. He sounds like he's uh, um, in a witness box. <coughs> he sounds like he's to be accused. <coughs> he's making a solid case. He wants to affirm his integrity. He wants to describe the source of his authority. And it's the same as the, as the one uh, that he now declares he wants to please. He denies any wrongdoing. And Paul establishes in this his credentials as an apostle. Um, as he does in, in several letters, he justifies himself, not out of pride, but because he wants to um, uh, point out clearly that the message is more important than the messenger. But actually, if the message is going to be believed, the messenger has to be believed. If we kind of move on to the next bit, having just sort of given that context, I want to just look briefly at, at our calling in our church. What are the the aspects of our faith which we hold dear to. Um, and we've, well, we've talked about these, these things before, before, part of the makeup of, of any Christian church, and that, that they are, that we want to um, reflect the grace of God in worship. We want to apply the grace of God to each other in fellowship and in building up. And we want to extend the grace of God to our community, to our nation, to the ends of the earth, to see people saved. So those Three things, we want to reflect the grace of God in our worship, we want to apply the grace of God to each other in fellowship, we want to extend the grace of God uh, as we reach out to our community. And this passage really is predominantly about the, the second of those, about our fellowship together. <coughs> Excuse me. About applying the grace of God to each other uh, for our building up. And there are lots of different aspects to this, of course. Um, and we'll look at just a part of it. But the key um, question arises from verse 7 and 8. Um, Paul goes on to say to the people of Thessalonica, he says, We were gentle among you, like a nursing mother, taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become very dear to us. These are quite tender words, aren't they? After those first few uh, verses that are, that are almost a, a slightly shouty, um, you know, our appeal does not spring from error. We've been approved by God. We speak not to please man. We never came with words of flattery. God is our witness. It was very kind of robust defense, and now it's very tender. We were gentle among you, like a nursing mother. If you're trying to think of an example of gentleness, it's hard to think of a uh, more um, vivid example of a gentle person and a mother nursing a baby. And Paul writes, we share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Several other translations have it, our own soul. And that's probably a better word. It isn't just our material life. Uh, it is about our, our heart, who it is that we are at the core, who we are in God. Let's unpack this. We heard a few week, weeks ago, uh, last time I spoke uh, from this passage, from, from this book, <clears throat> the way the gospel breathed, breathed life into this city. In chapter 1, Paul writes, For our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. So the gospel arrived full of power, when <clears throat> people became imitators of Paul and Timothy, and lives were changed. And that's what we want in this town, isn't it? We want lives to change. There are people out there who don't know God. There are people out there crying out. There are people who are thirsty because they've not heard from God. All they've heard is at some point in the distance that it's been forgotten or put aside, um, or they've been, um, you know, as Paul, uh, Jesus speaks about the parable of the sower, um, that, that they've heard the gospel, but the sun has burnt it, or the, or the, um, the thorns have choked it, um, and it's not been productive in their lives. We want to see lives changed in Fenniston as they've changed in Thessalonica. And I think, 
as I was reading about this and thinking and, and, and reading what others have, uh, have thought of this passage, one thing that struck me was um, uh, a guy called John Piper who noted that um, uh, he draws out of this that wherever the gospel flourishes, wherever the gospel is productive, we see Christians sharing the gospel. But more than that, we see Christians sharing their own lives, sharing their souls. And this is the example that Paul and Timothy give us um, in their dealings with this, uh, this city of Thessalonica. And what does it mean to share your own life, to share your soul? Um, let's think about three questions. The first is, what does it mean? The second is, assuming this is, this is, a, this is God's work, how does the gospel cause this to happen? And the third question is, what does that look like for us as, as people and as a church? So the first of these, what is it to share your own soul? It's more than sharing the gospel. It's more than just sharing the gospel with people, although there is, it is certainly that. It's not less than sharing the gospel. We were eager to, we were eager to share not only the gospel, but also. So we share the gospel, and it's more, but also our own souls. And you haven't shared your life and your soul with somebody if all you've done is give them some information, even priceless, life-saving information about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul goes on, it's more than just hard work. Paul and Timothy worked hard. They, wherever they went, from, from city to city, they made a point of not being a burden on their hosts. Paul made tents, and he taught the new believers as well, so <clears throat> he didn't uh, come to a, a fledgling church, which you know initially would have perhaps just been two families gathered in somebody's house. Uh, he didn't come and say, I need you to tithe so that you can pay my, uh, my salary. Um, he came and taught them and shared the gospel and, uh, and shared uh, what God had given them, and then in the afternoon, evening, who knows when, they started sewing um, and made some tents. Um, the first tent we had as a family, uh, when my mum and dad had, I think was one of Paul's tents. It was ancient, it weighed a ton, um, and uh, it was one of those massive steel frame things that I, you needed a caravan in order to transport this tent. It was just awful, um, but by it, it just would not die. <laughs> so it just went off. It was well made, um, and we were desperately hoping that it would eventually pack up. Um, eventually, it did. Uh, but Paul and Timothy, Paul made tents. Um, he says in verse 9 You remember, brothers, our labour and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim the gospel. So, Paul very clearly is saying, We're coming to bring the gospel. That's not enough. We want to share our souls. We're sharing the gospel anyway. We're working hard. It's more than that. Maybe it's about being holy and blameless. Verse 10, it says, You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you, believers. And again, the answer is, no, it isn't that either. So what does it mean? See the heart of Paul's self-giving is seen pretty well. Let's just skip forward to verse 17. Um, verse 17, he says, Since we were bereft, and the word really means orphaned, we were bereft from you, brethren, for a short time, in person, not in heart. We endeavoured the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. This is starting to get at what Paul is saying, that you know, we really missed you. We belong with you. We feel part of you. We were bereft for a short time, in person, not in heart. So we were actually separated. Physically, we were separated by geography, but we never stopped uh, caring for you. When you share your soul, you let somebody really see what's really in there. If I do that, I don't conceal my true feelings about things. A shared soul is a shared passion, a shared fear, or a shared guilt, or a shared longing, or a shared joy. But wherever the gospel flourishes, people share their lives, they share their souls, whether it be joy, or guilt, or fear, or longing, or sadness, or passion, whatever it is, whatever's going on in your life. What Paul is saying is, 
Ki kisem ki di korang ada dengar ni. In chapter 2 verse 17, Paul shares his great desire, as we've just uh, read. But also uh, in other verses, um, in chapter 3 and verse 5, uh, he's telling them how hard it is to be in Athens, not knowing how they're getting on. So let's just take a moment to think about whether we are living that passionately with people. Do we as a church live that passionately together? Do we share our lives and our songs? Do we know what it is to be open and broken and, and happy and sad and messy with each other? Well, let's move on. How does the gospel cause this to happen? Verse 7. You know that transition from Paul defending himself being very robust to verse 7. He was gentle with you, like a nursing mother taking care of her children. In Galatians, Paul writes, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. You remember those things. The fruit of the Spirit is, you know, it, it's giving orders, it's obeying orders, it's being shouty, it's being rough, and so it's being determined and resolved. No, it isn't. It's gentleness, kindness, faithfulness. All those things, you know, we, when we think of the fruit of the Spirit, we can get them with love and joy and peace, we're all up for, yeah? You know, we can, yes, love, joy and peace, but you will find a Christian that disagrees with that. And faithfulness, kindness, and gentleness, and faithfulness, and perhaps even sharpness, and, and patience. Just, you know, I came to patience last. Do you remember, how many of you remember Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible? Do you remember that? Um, and when John Proctor uh, was being asked to recite the Ten Commandments because he'd not been in church recently, and he forgets the one which is his son and God. Do you remember that? He forgets and has to be reminded by his wife of the last one, which is adultery as well. <laughs> yeah, in that list, I kind of forgot patience. Um, and uh, in the same way that John Proctor forgot the one that's good stuff. <laughs> Don't say anything. Paul describes this gentleness and tenderness of a mother. It's the best example he can think of. Uh, about what the gospel produces in us when it flourishes, when it reaches full fulfillment. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And the second thing is, not only will the gospel uh, bring about a kindly treatment of others, and that's how we feel sometimes, it's that ge is that gentleness and faithfulness about how we treat people. When the gospel flourishes, it actually gives us Kindly and uh, kindly feelings towards other believers, sweet affections. Verse eight: being affectionately desirous of you. you know, Paul isn't saying, "Oh well, we had a job to do, and we better come back and, and talk to you some more, because uh, heaven knows we need to hear it." He's describing as being affectionately desirous. He's going on thinking, oh, "I love these people; they're great." Being affectionately desirous of you. We're ready to share with you not only the gospel, but also our own selves, because you've become very dear to us. It's quite common today to speak about love as being a decision or an act. We choose to love somebody. Um, I'm sure you've heard it said um, that uh, we should love the sinner to hate the sin. I'm sure you've heard it said that actually we're called to love people, not necessarily to like them. Uh, and do you know how many of you have used that line? Um, and uh, I know I have. And it's true as far as it goes, but that's not what's happening when the gospel really flourishes in our hearts. Love is a choice about how we regard and treat somebody, maybe. And there are times when I've had to take a deep breath, bite my lip, make a conscious choice not to treat someone the way I feel they might deserve it at that moment because of something they said or done. But to extend grace, despite how I feel. And you may have felt the same. Maybe about me. Paul writes to the church in Rome in chapter 12, chapter 12 and verse 10. He says, love, love one another, love 
one another with brotherly affection. Brotherly affection. Two words uh, sort of combined in that. Philadelphia, um, we know about brotherly love. <coughs> Philostorgoi, which means loving with strong affection. Um, we know that we have brothers, um, both Christian brothers and, uh, and for some uh, earthly human brothers, that we, uh, we just don't necessarily, you know, we love them with, uh, uh, with Philadelphia, with brotherly love, but we really have strong affection for them. Um, and that's Paul is, is instructing us. We love each other with brotherly affection, a strong affection. We should have a heart for each other, not just a cold, calculated decision to treat each other well, but we should certainly do that. It isn't just Paul, it's Peter as well. In Peter chapter 1, verse 2, love one another earnestly from the heart. Not just be dutiful to each other, not just make the right decisions about supporting people and encouraging them. Do it from the heart. As Christians, we're very aware of life and death. And like everyone else, we plan for the future, we kind of think of our uh, immediate future in practical ways, we kind of uh, try and have a pension if we can, and maybe pay off a mortgage, and we think about retiring at some point. But really our perspective is eternal. I was talking to somebody only yesterday about um, somebody who was describing his, 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 I can't remember how old he was, but he was about 60-ish. He was talking about how he had some health problems and how he was getting worse. And, and he made some offhand comment about, you know, how oh, well, you know, we've only got so many years and we might as well enjoy it and it all comes to an end. Um, and I, just, I said to him, I said, yeah, well, what do you plan for afterwards? Um, and he said, there's no afterwards, no, there really is. There's a plan for afterwards, I said, well, that's what he's like and on. Without, uh, without us anymore. But, you know, we might see it from time to time. We'll pick that up another time. But we're aware of life and death. You know, it's not like so long since we were thinking about Easter. We think about the death of Jesus. And then we think about the life of Jesus, his resurrection. We kind of, uh, we live on the brink of eternity and we look at each other. And we should have in our hearts the sweet affection. You know, at the, the time of death, we, are, we think very much about that kind of farewell and about reunion. We know that we may be separated from each other for a time, but the reunion will be sweeter than the sorrow of the parting. And so we live in this moment of knowing about uh, the extremes of affection. Uh, and we should be getting to a point where we share our lives and souls with a sweet affection. What does it look like for us? This is my third question. Jesus uh, said these words, By this will all men know that you are mine. That you love one another. That you love one another. If we want the gospel to be effective in this town, through our church, through us, we must first know what it is to love one another. People need to see that we love one another. When I first came to this church in another place, and we were at the time, like maybe 20, not 20 years ago, but 17, 18 years ago, um, it was a small group. The first time I visited, um, there, it was a combined meeting with a church from Stockport or somewhere across the, the other side of Pennines. And, um, uh, and I turned up, and actually what was evident, and I didn't know who belonged to the Peniston Church and who belonged to that church, um, uh, I was quite aware that there were several odd people there. Um, I'll talk, to me, talk, talk to me afterwards and I'll tell you which church they belong to. Um, <laughs> there were several odd people, but actually what was apparent was this is the worshipping community and the people there love each other. And actually, that persisted. The following week, when there were just a, a very small number, I mean, five or six who were in those days, I mean, we didn't often get to ten, did we? Um, well, that was, that was before my time. Um, um, so, so I can't be responsible for the decline. Um, <laughs> I, but, but five or six, seven or eight people, there was Anne, and there was Dennis and Sue, um, um, and Shona, um, and that was about it from people who are still in this church. Um, Nick and Joe joined us a year or two later. Um, Pam and Joe uh, after that, so about the same sort of time. And, um, the rest of you, uh, you know, 
So uh, we have a group of people uh, in the second week when uh, the, uh, the stuff part of it all stuff part when they left. Um, there's a group of people who met and worshipped God, and they loved God and they loved each other, and that much was evident. And so we thought, have a look, we can make our home there. So we're racking our brains trying to think where they were from. I've got good news: the old people were from the other church. Quite a lot. <laughs> so it's really important, isn't it, that, uh, that not only so, uh, that uh, we are known to belong to Christ because we love each other. It's not just a decision made to treat each other right, but as the gospel works its way into your soul, it will give you a kind affection, a care, a true fellowship. Fellowship is not just about getting together and having coffee together or having a barbecue or whatever. It's not the, not the eating and drinking are part of fellowship, but it is about a kind affection. And so my question is, how, how is this for us? How will, what does it look like for us? Is, do we spend time together? And I don't mean on a Sunday. Of course we spend time together on a Sunday. Here we are, together, on a Sunday. I don't even mean home group on Tuesdays. God would say, that's not your practice, just pray about it, because we should be together. I don't know, we all get busy, and we all have family nights, and we all have uh, things going on uh, around our health, and times when we feel we can't face it, but think about this. When did you last see a member of the church family outside on maybe Tuesday? When did you last see them? When were you last in touch just to offer help, or ask for help, or just to have coffee? Just to meet up to, to have kindness, to share kindness, to go for a walk, to talk about something every day. Maybe it's been a while. And I'd encourage you to take a step this week. You know, just send a text to somebody asking for help. Or offering for help. I got offers of help this week, even only yesterday. Um, just a text from somebody saying, uh, is there a small thing I can do for you uh, for tomorrow? It wasn't a big deal. But it was just a kind offer. And it was gratefully received. There are enough of us who have a dozen hours in the night for that to be beneficial. But as we draw to a close, let's consider this. That encouragement to be in touch with each other, to be supporting each other, this isn't just me being pastoral and wanting everyone to feel supported in our fellowship. Well, I hope that is true. But this is Paul's teaching. This is Paul's encouragement to the people of the church in Thessalonica, where the gospel flourished. And that was his encouragement, his instruction to them, that the gospel may take hold in their city. And if we want the same for this town, yes, we will need to share the gospel. And yes, we know that we don't feel very comfortable with doing that because we don't think we're very good at it. But we do it anyway. We need to do that more. We need to work hard. It is hard work. Uh, serving God together can be hard work. We do need to try and live as righteous and blameless as we can, thanking God that it is only by His grace in our lives that we can achieve a measure of that. But if the gospel is going to flourish in Hexton, we need to be a people who are sharing our souls with each other and who will welcome in anyone who comes and share our lives and our souls with them too. And it's by doing that the gospel will flourish. That's the message that Paul is giving at the beginning of this letter to the church in Thessalonica. And I commend that to us as a church, that we do that too. Let's pray. Lord, so often we've asked 
for transformation in this town. We've asked for people to come to you. And we long to see hundreds, if not thousands, flooding your houses, coming to know you. People coming to faith for the first time, people having their faith rekindled. And we want to be a people who will share the good news that you invested in us so that people can hear. But we ask, Lord, that by the Holy Spirit filling us, we will be able to share our lives with each other and with those who come to receive you. So that the gospel not merely gets heard in this town, but that it flourishes. Only know, Lord, that that is entirely a work that you do. That we want to be part of it. So we ask, Lord, that you would help us to hear what Paul is saying. To weigh it and consider it and to, to read the gospel. And to submit our lives to you. So that we become more like you, so that we love one another ever more closely. And so that those around us will see that and come to faith. We ask that in your name and for your glory. Amen.